Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, this is the first event of term, and we're in our open period, so um, I'm assuming some of you are non-members. Um, if you like this, I'd recommend getting a membership, and we'll have much more events like that. Um, Liv Bury here is uh, multiple times poker champ and um, has founded several charities and also presented on TV many times. So um, thank you, Liv, for joining us, and I hope to get right into it. Yeah, thank you for having me. Just had my first tour of some of the colleges. It's, this place is incredible. Yeah. yeah. Trinity or John's? <sighs> <laughs> Come on. Fine, Trinity. Oh, wow. Sorry. John's. Okay. <laughs> I haven't seen uh, that one. I don't think Downing's getting on any lists, mate. Um, yeah, so I, I think one thing that interests me a lot about your life is um, the crazy situations you've been in the, in the high stakes scenarios. And of course, you know, many of us um, enjoy poker in a casual setting, but it's completely another whole different ball game um, mm -hmm. playing professionally. Um, and I want to talk particularly about um, your 2010 San Remo win. Um, you know, could you describe you know what it was like in that tournament setting, and perhaps you know how you felt some plays that you made during that? What was it like? Ah, uh, man. I mean, it was definitely the most intense week of my life. Um, so, I mean, I don't know how much of my background you all know, um, but for that, for, does has everyone here played poker? Like literally everyone in the room. Great. Okay. Um, so you all know what San Remo, e EPT San Remo is. Well, it's a big tournament um, in Italy that was part of the European Poker Tour. And I wasn't even expecting to play it. That's the funny thing. Uh, the only reason I was there was because the, remember that Icelandic vol volcano whose name I can never pronounce? <laughs> Whatever it is. Um, that thing erupted while I was in the south of France for another reason. Mm. And I couldn't get home. And I was with another poker player called uh, Liz Lou if anyone remembers her, and she was like, oh, well, we can't go anywhere. I hear there's a big tournament in Italy happening. It's a few train rides away. Why don't we try and get over to that? And uh, so took the train. I think there was a French strike on, as always. Uh, so it was a real arduous journey to even get there. We eventually get there. I get there just in time to play, to enter the satellite, because I, at the time, my bankroll was not enough to be entering 5K EPTs. Um, but uh, there was a 500 satellite, and I just made it in the nick of time for that won my seat that night, so then I played the next day. And uh, yeah, I mean, day one was kind of whatever. I made it through. Um, I think this was the second EBT I ever played. Um, so, you know, a pretty, it, was, it was a big deal for me. Um, and then I think I became chip leader at the end of day three, and that was when I started being like, Oof, okay, this is stressful. And then I just progressively, so the whole tournament was six days long in the end. And each subsequent day, as obviously the stakes get higher and higher, I would sleep. I think it corresponded to like an hour and a half less sleep per night. And I mean, by the end of that six day thing, I, I don't even know how. The night before the final table, I think I probably slept about an hour and a half. I was literally just playing hands in my head that didn't even exist. They weren't even hands I played. It was just, you're in this like quasi dream state where, I mean, maybe if any of you've played a lot before, or even like if you've done a lot of exams, you sort of end up, it's like your brain just can't switch off, right? You're just doing these calculations in this, in this sort of liminal state. Um, so yeah, I was just like, oh, pocket jacks, or seven, eight suited. Um, and then that final morning, you know, I just mentioned to you guys when we were th through signing the book, <laughs> maybe TMI, but I was so nervous I had to stop like four times on the way to the casino, walking from my hotel to throw up. It was so stressful. Um, but somehow, like once I actually sat down at the table and got the first, like felt the cards in my hand, I just sort of, this, the nerves by and large went away and I just it somehow got into this zone where I was able to by and large think clearly. And then I ended up winning it. So yeah, it was the, I mean, I don't wanna say best week of my life, but it was probably the most notable week of my life. It was so intense and what an experience. Um, I remember in one of your interviews um, nearer to the time you talked about a flow state that you mm. felt getting into where it, um, it just came more naturally. Uh, could you tell us about that and you know what was that like? Yeah so I mean the flow state's interesting the way I understand it. Um, there's this guy Jamie Wheel 
if any of you are familiar with him, who's kind of like the expert, he has the, the Flow Genome Project. And, you know, his, his description, um, or at least his group's description of it, is sort of where the thing is just on that sweet spot of difficulty where you're slightly out of your comfort zone, but not so uncomfortable that you feel like you're completely out of your depth. Um, and I guess that's probably what helped me get into it with the tournament. I mean, although frankly, I did feel out of my depth, you know, when I'm, because especially when I made that final table, ninth place was already guaranteed like, I think 80,000 80, euros, which was about double what I had in my bank account at the time. So I was already like so out of my depth in terms of comfort level. So I don't even know if it's technically what I was in counted as flow state. But I mean, I can describe the sort of feeling that I was in and it honestly felt like, and this is gonna sound weird, it just felt like something was guiding me wherever I needed to go. Just the cards I needed. Remember, <laughs> again, silly, but there was, I, uh, I got all in on the end of day five and I had kings against ace 10. I, I had the person covered, but we were like, it was, this is what gave me this huge chip lead um, at that time. Uh, and so it was a very critical moment. And obviously kings are a big favorite, but we've all seen that ace come out. And I just remember going, I, I, I just don't even want, I, I can't deal with this. I don't even want to sweat this. The first two cards, as you know, they dealt the flop, king, king. I just flopped quads. <laughs> and I was like, thank you, phew. Uh, so, you know, take of that what you will. You know, these, these, these funny moments always happen, but it felt, the, the, the feeling felt like something was taking care of me and guiding me. Like I was, like it was my, t I was just always meant to win this. And again, this is gonna sound really weird. I don't want you to all think I'm some, some you know, crazy person, but I talked about it on my Lex Friedman podcast. On the very first day, just before the tournament started, um, they were playing, I remember poker stars would always play like pump up music sort of to get everyone excited. And they played Chemical Brothers, Hey Boy, Hey Girl, while their like promo video played and the lights went down. And while that was happening, I got like a rush of goosebumps through my body and a voice in my head said, you are gonna win this tournament. And I was like, Ugh, cool, okay. And then I won the tournament. So I don't know, I, I, you know, the, the, the logical explanation is, you know, I, it was a retroactive memory kind of, like maybe I always have that kind of confidence and it's just because then I won it that I look back and go, you know, but that, I remember that sort of that feeling of feeling like that was something weird was at play gave me this additional confidence. So maybe that's flow state, I don't know. All I can sort of describe is, is you know, my, my experience and that's what it felt like. Uh, but that said, you know, I won other tournaments where I didn't have anything like that. Certainly I was in the zone, but never to this degree of just like, unbelievable presence and just, just, you know, everything else disappeared once I actually was at the table. So yeah, it's really cool. If you can ever get that feeling, recommend it. <laughs> um, and then onto a slightly more technical question. Um, it's been raised by, by some people before the event that, um, you know, obviously there's been a switch from like sort of uh, street smarts poker to mm -hmm. more uh, GTO based poker. Um, when it comes down to it, who would you, do you think street smart players you know, can win against GTO optimized ones or people who base on that strategy and what's yeah. the sort of balance between that? So I can only answer sort of probabilistically about this. My money would be on, let's, let's put it this way, if there was someone who okay well who's the, like, the ultimate example of sort of a street smarts player who really hasn't seemed to emulate, learned or emulated GTO, it's Phil Helmuth, right? Um, if I had to bet, you know, if, if Phil Helmuth versus Jungle Man, or um, what's his name? Uh, True Teller, who's probably, probably slightly better even than Jungle Man, you know, the GTO versus Street Smarts, if those two were to play against each other, I mean, certainly heads up over a large sample size, like I'd be an idiot not to put my money on on uh, you know the GTO player, right? That said, you know by definition, if you're playing GTO, there is nothing that your opponent can do to exploit you. But that doesn't mean to say that if you are in that moment against a GTO player who is playing, you know, the optimal frequency of bluffing at the right, you know, they have the right bluffing frequency in this certain situation. That doesn't mean that there isn't information available at the time that they're giving off that will tell you that actually, in this case, they, they are bluffing 
because they know that you know whether they're like oh I did my I flipped my coin and okay so my, my I'm I'm bluffing 30% of the time here they still know that they're bluffing so there is that information available right and in theory a good street smarts player will be able to pick up on that um, in a way that like a GTO robot wouldn't you see what I mean so it, it, and 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 I think there's a reason why like technically yes the GTO player should always win but there's something Phil Helmuth is doing. Right when it, like to continually have these results. I mean, maybe he's just the on the extreme end of the bell curve. Someone has to be the luckiest, but he does seem to have these incredible intuitions where he's just like, I just know that the I just know that they have it here. I'm going to make this crazy fold. You were looking and thought, did you have a thing to add? Um, yeah. Um, to what extent in your playing does sort of the more uh, street smartish tactics come in? Like, you know, what sort of tells mm. you look for can you give us some advice about that yeah i mean so i should be clear here i mean i quit poker three years ago now and i actually went and played for the first time i played once at the world series uh, not the main event uh this summer and then i played uh the wpt back in december and <laughs> like it was shocking just like how much my poker play has fallen off. Like, I'm sure there are better players here in this room than me now. But just because, if, if any of you have been keeping up with it, just because I haven't been studying the charts and, and you know, there's, it's, all, it's always like kind of an arms race, right? Like, oh, people are leaning more towards sort of check raising in these spots now, so then there's a counterplay, et cetera. Um, and, sorry, team me up with a question again? It was, oh. Um, yeah, so what's the role of sort of street smarts tactics um, right. in your own game? Yeah, so, because I have, I noticed when I was playing in December, because my, you know, my, my training in, in terms of studying GTO has completely disappeared. I've essentially forgotten it all. I don't know what the, the frequencies are. I've, I'm having to revert back to these like street smarts that I, you know, that I've sort of built up from playing poker for 15 years. And I found, my, I was like, oh, I'm just, I'm playing, well, I wish I was playing like Phil Helmuth, um, but I was, I was just a field player, you know? and and, and that was an interesting thing to be able to sort of be okay with that and like hang up my hat, you know, like I'm no longer Livbury the poker player, I'm Livbury the like, I'm a poker tourist. That's how it felt, um, uh, which was slightly difficult to accept, but in, in many ways it was kind of freeing. And I had more fun than I've ever had actually in a long time because I wasn't like, I didn't have this like high benchmark expecting myself to be at. Um, so that said, at the sort of top of my game, let's say around 2015, 2016, when I was working with Pio Solver and those kind of things at the time, um, I was trying to adhere to as close to GTO Optimal as, as, as I could. Um, and that said, I, f I feel like, you know, my, my style of play and like personally what I liked the most about poker was the sort of the hustle and, and the street smarts and the getting under people's skin or you know, this, this, this ducking and weaving part of the game as opposed to just like studying the charts and then going out and playing in this robust but robotic style. That just wasn't for me. And it was actually when I started, in many ways, it was actually my lowest enjoyment period of the game, which incidentally coincided with actually when I was probably playing technically best. I just wasn't having that much fun. Um, and interestingly, my results around that time kind of reflected it. And I mean, the reason why I know I was playing in my best is because my partner, Igor Kurganov, who you might be aware of, you know, he was at one point, the number he was able to sell at the highest markup, which is arguably sort of one of the best ways of knowing who the best player of the world is at that time. He was selling at the highest rate. So let's say he was at least top three in the world. So he was like my little oracle. You know, I'd make note of my hand, uh, you know, some hands, and then I'd ask him afterwards and be like, oh, so what do you think? And he's like, yeah, you played that right, that right, that right. And, and so that was, he was at his happiest uh, in his review of my hands at that time. So that's why I say I was playing technically best, but I was having the least amount of fun. And my results were also really poor. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's very interesting thing to, to juggle. And I think it just depends, you know, who knows if I had gotten into poker when everyone was already moving into the GTO thing, maybe that would have been, I, I would have loved it and embraced it as deeply. But I think because I came from the sort of pre GTO times, the two that, you know, I first learned to play in 2005 when it was really all about the hustle and the characters. Um, I just kind of missed that. Yeah. Um, I think you mentioned in the past that you started out on game shows and then um, went into online poker, learning up some tactics from that. Um, would you have any uh, particular tips 
for the learning process because you know most of us here are um, getting our poker feet yeah okay well the ultimate tip i'll give you right now um a friend has just made an app and it's embarrassing i can't remember the name i think it's hoach poker anyway it's bill perkins if any of you know who he is he's tweeting about it nonstop. go on his twitter and his app download that because it it's it's going to break poker essentially it is a it's like a poker iq test so it gives you like 120 different decision points 120 spots um, and it's got a slide bar and basically you've got to enter in it'll give you like three or four sort of multiple choices you know check bet 33 percent of the pot bet or bet 28 percent bet 32 percent bet 76 percent bet 120 percent so you know these sort of classic gto um solutions and and then you have to enter onto the slide bar what percentage you know what your mix is what are your frequencies and and then it will show you what the optimal one is and it's you know i, I don't know if people are still using pio solver but like that's a very unpleasant way of trying to absorb GTO, you know, the optimal betting frequencies information. This app is so pleasant and it's so fun and it's so accessible to even beginners. So, um, you know, I don't mean to pimp his app, but it is going to be the best way. And I think if you want to become the best player you can be and learn GTO, that's, that's going to be the new method. Um, but again, it depends what you're wanting to do with poker. Uh, I would not recommend anyone these days, even incredibly talented players, to try and make it as a living. Because, you know, uh, even, again, with, with an app like this, the average Joe will be able to be playing roughly GTO very quickly. So, like, where's the value coming from? The va there is, there's just not much value anymore available. Um, now, that's not to say that live poker won't still be good, because technically, you know, you won't be able to have this information available, you know, at least not on tap, like you would in online poker. Um, but I, I, I would not recommend getting into the game as a, as a main source of money making anymore, unfortunately. That said, I do think everyone should learn it and play it as a means of becoming the best thinker they can, because I don't think there is a better game on planet Earth for emulating the kind of messiness of high stakes decision making that you do in real life, right? So, uh, yeah, that's my sort of caveat, I guess. Yeah. Um, and then moving on now to your charity, Raising for Effective Giving. Um, I, I was watching some old interviews last night, as you can probably tell, but um, I think you mentioned that you were originally inspired for that idea by meeting a Swiss, I believe, mm -hmm. German, um, poker player, Stefan Huber. Yes, Stefan Huber, yeah. Huber yeah. Um, who solely donated all his winnings to charity, but did it in... Um, the most like effective way possible. So could you tell us a bit about like the process of setting up that charity and mm. um, the logic that goes behind it? Yeah, so uh, there, yeah, there was this poker player, Stefan, who was already doing that, which was sort of mind blowing. It was the first time I'd met, because it wasn't like he was a mega rich guy. You know, he was just like one of us, but he was giving away huge chunks of his winnings to these, to charity. And I was just like, how, why? Like, how do you even know the charity is good? He's like, ah. Well, here's the process, and it's this, you know, you might all have heard of it at this point. Unfortunately, it became even more famous because, for the wrong reasons, because of this Sam Bankman-Fried nightmare. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, that guy. Uh, but the, the, the principle is effective altruism, which is essentially kind of applying the scientific method to the question of, like, how do we do the most good given our limited resources? Um, and of course, then it comes down to like the very question, difficult question of what is good? How do we measure it? Can we even measure it? Um, and then like personal moral philosophies, etc. But it's at least, you know, trying to think through this problem in, in, a, in a logical, reasonable way. Um, and yeah, so then just, I remember Igor and uh, another friend, Philip Grusome, got, you know, they were friends with Stefan and, and they got sort of really interested in, in it and then we all went and met with uh, these uh, f Swiss philosophers who were pretty involved in it, and they just sort of explained it all. And it was like a light bulb moment to me because, you know, I've always been, you know, I've always liked to do good. I like to, you know, if there's if there's an option to give to charity, and I have, you know, it doesn't, it's not going to break the bank. I would have always been interested in doing it, but it never really resonated because. 
you know, I guess part, especially if you become a poker player, you tend to think of things in, in terms of return on investment, and you're very quantified and logical in all in the things that you do. So. I didn't feel like the philanthropy, you know, anything in charity was ever, it, it just felt like I would see uh, some sad advert, you know, of like some poor child, child abuse or animal abuse and be like, oh, that's, this is terrible. Here, take some money. And then I forget all about it. Um, but then hearing about, wait, there are people who literally, they're really, really, really smart and they're dedicating their time to like figuring out the most optimal ways of actually improving the world. Okay, this, this seems to sort of resonate more with the poker player style of thinking. So we, um, after meeting them, and they, they were the ones who said, look, we think poker players will get this because they think this way. Um, do you want to see if you can like set up some kind of vehicle or like way of, just by, basically a way of like raising awareness of this way of thinking. Um, so yeah, we made Raising for Effective Giving with the ob obvious pun in the name. Um, and it was extraordinarily successful. Like poker players, they loved it. They were, you know, they... Um, I think it ended up moving fourteen million dollars in the end. It's a little difficult sometimes with counting because then uh, and then what's really cool is another poker player, Dan Smith, um, started his thing called Double Up Drive, which has been even more successful and is still going. Um, we we sort of sunsetted raising for effective giving now, like twenty right around the time Igor and I both quit because Phil had quit and no one else was really there to sort of run it and push it forward. But also Dan is doing such a good job, you know, it wasn't really needed anymore. But um, yeah, and and it's still a philosophy I hold like very, very much because it's, you know, it's, I think the movement itself has grown so large that it's starting to get these things tend to take on a little bit of a life of their own. And then, it, you know, it's almost become a brand. And when things become a brand, then it starts getting sort of co-opted in weird ways. And then it also attracts the, the SBFs of the world and so on. Um, although, let's not get into that. But, <laughs> you know, um, it's it, the, 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 the actual core principle of just the question of how do we triage the world's problems um, you know, we have to we have to try and fix them. How do we triage them? Is so important, and that's all it really means. Um, whatever label on it you put on it doesn't really matter. It's just like it's just the process of thinking through um, and using science and reason to, to come you know come to the best answer you can. Um, and then, what are you doing now? Given that your poker days are behind you, or is there a place for poker in your further life? Where are you aimed at? No, I mean this is really to the extent of the poker that's in my life these days. Um, but actually, this I love this. This is great, um, and I really look forward. To, you know, feel free to ask me lots of poker questions. Um, uh, what I'm doing now is mostly well. My main focus is uh, I'm trying to get a podcast off the ground. Recorded a few episodes so far. Um, and I'm in the middle of this nightmare YouTube series on this thing called Moloch, which is this uh, a name. If any of you read Slate Star Codex, uh, he wrote this incredible blog called Meditations on Moloch. Please, if you, any of you haven't read it, go read it. It's one of the best, most important pieces of writing out there because it's talking about the game theoretic drivers of so many of these, you know, the, the mis the, these problems in our civilization you know, whether it's deforestation, pollution, climate change, um, AI, uh, nuclear proliferation, uh, it's all arguably driven by the same game theoretic force of like people optimizing for winning a short term game at the cost of the wider whole. So these sort of coordination failures, you know, because if we could all just coordinate, then we wouldn't be polluting the atmosphere and causing climate change. But that's, that's the problem. Coordination is difficult because of these game theoretic, these, ba these bad incentives. Um, so I'm making a YouTube series on that. And there's like Scott Alexander, this blogger, coined this thing, this, this weird force. Um, he called it Moloch, um, based on various reasons. But uh, I'm trying to bring this to life uh, through video. Um, and I like dress up as it. And uh, I've done one episode called The Beauty Wars, which is you know, giving a very small scale example, uh, all these beauty filters that people are using more and more and more to sort of get, make their pictures stand out, but it's sort of creating this race to the bottom of sort of Kim, Kim faces, Kim, Kim Kardashian type faces on the internet. Um, 
And uh, my next episode, which is nearly done, I, it might come out next week actually, is on this sort of same process, but within the media, because so much of this divisiveness we're seeing is because ultimately rage and division is what makes media the most money. And so there are these perverse incentives. They, the more bad stuff happens, they, they want bad things to happen because that's how they get paid. And that's pretty fucked up. Uh, so yeah, that's my like current obsession and I'm making as much content about that. But then also, I need to now start talking about, well, okay, what's the solution to this? Because one thing you can do is make people aware of the problem, but we need to come up with a, a solution. And so far, the best thing I've got is this, is like an aesthetic. Uh, it's this character called Win-Win. So if Moloch is like this laser-focused, sort of demonic, like, you must win, make as much money as you can right now, no, don't worry, no, just win, win-win. Moloch, Win-Win, uh, uh, is, you know, because Moloch is the god of negative sum games, right? Like lose, lose, lose situations. So win, win, it's pretty obvious, right? Um, and it's, it's very fun loving. It's not like, oh, we must all coordinate. It's not like holier than thou. It likes getting a little bit, you know, dirty. It likes a zero sum game. There's definitely space for competition in its world. But it, the point is it's got the wisdom to know how much competition is optimal and when when a competition starts getting a little bit too adversarial and more like it can like slap it down and be like no no let's all coordinate for a bit um, so I appreciate that probably doesn't seem that clear but I think with with a problem as esoteric as this starting out with an aesthetic first it sort of might just give people the inspiration to see what can arise from it because uh, it will be a sort of to, to, to solve these game theoretic problems it's going to require literally inhuman levels of coordination. And so we almost have to go into this weird hy hypothetical metaphysical realm and like create these like ideas and hive minds and that sort of thing. Do you have a name for the series so we can look it up? I, I mean, it's just, yeah, it's uh, the first video is called The Beauty Wars. Um, then this next one will be called The Media Wars. And then my plan for the third one is sort of probably The War of Wars or The Meta Wars, haven't decided yet. And then I'm going to introduce Win Win from there. Uh, and then the other thing I'm working on is uh, this podcast, which is, again, it's going to be called Win Win, uh, and interviewing people who I think best understand, you know, have dealt with a lot of competition within their industry and have a good sense of when is competition healthy versus unhealthy. Because that's really what we've got to figure out. It's like, what is, how do we have more healthy competition in our society um, and keep the unhealthy stuff to a minimum? Because right now it's completely out of balance. Yeah. Um, well, thanks, Liv. I think we're going to move to a quick Q and A. So, um, if anyone's got any questions, please put your hand up. Yep. Okay, at the back there. Um, could you show us your poker face? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, you, this this is it. People think a poker face is. I mean, it can be if you are. The the. What you want to achieve through a poker face is relaxation. Whatever makes you as internally relaxed as possible inside, because when you're relaxed, then you are just, you're not over-focusing on what the actual thing is that you're trying to hide, right? Um, but that said, it, it can be very difficult to be, if, you know, if you're a naturally dynamic person, um, it might be a bit easier, but for some people are quite stoic anyway, and so like going full, robotic and stoic might be might be the way um, in terms of like where you get the most useful body language faces aren't actually that useful you know we all learn as a as a child oh if someone's lying to you then they won't look you in the eye so then the first thing we do is overcompensate and we make sure we make eye contact when we're lying um, so the point is is that people are very aware aware of what their faces and hands are doing but what they don't think about is lower down on the body so uh, my rule of thumb is always like look what see what the feet are up to because I mean I notice it in myself when I get pocket aces my feet are just like it's just so hard you're like it's in there as cool as a cucumber up here but you're like a duck you know your feet are going mad um, so that is often a rule of thumb and 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 conversely if we're you know because you're excited you bounce around and if you're scared you tend to be in this like tense sort of frozen and often people will curl their legs around a tape around their chair leg I've again noticed my own legs doing it so um, it's probably less about poker face, it needs to be poker feet. Um, 
<laughs> and uh, yeah, and then obviously as well, uh, pulse rate is another useful one. Wear a scarf if you're playing against good players because they, they will be able to pick up stuff from your pulse. So you can see, if you look at someone, you know, how fast the pulse is going? Uh, yeah, it depends on the person. I, maybe it's like blood pressure related or something. Um, but there are, certain, <laughs> there are certain people who just have really visible... Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not the carotid, is it? It's the, what's the vein? Anyway, it's very, it's very visible. Um, and, but again, you have to be careful because excitement and fear present themselves very similarly, right? And you, you, so someone might have the best hand of their life or they might be completely bluffing their socks off and their pulse will be going really fast. So you, what, you need to be careful not to conflate them. One really useful one though is, you know, let's say someone's made a huge, you know, they've set you all in on the river and you've got, you can see their pulse and you can see it's going really fast. Make them wait, you know, while you're, you know, pretending to make, you're thinking about your decision. If after a couple of minutes their pulse is still going really fast, then they're more likely to be bluffing. Because if you think about it, if you've got a really strong hand and you're excited, you make the bet, I'm all in. But after a while, while the person's thinking, you, you're, you know, the, the pressure is off you. You don't have any more decisions to, you, you just hope they call. But, so your pulse, their pulse rates tend to like drop, drop off. But if they're bluffing the whole time, you know, bluffing, it's going to stay constant. Because they're just like, please fold, please fold, please fold. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another good one. Um, how's my poker face out? Doing very well. Oh. Okay, That's actually no pretty good. <laughs> what, the smile or the... Okay, it's I'll, actually I'll quite, it's quite intimidating. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I cringe so much looking back at the footage of me in San Remo because, I, I mean, I was so scared and overwhelmed. All I could do was stare at people. <laughs> and, and they're like, oh, it's the live stare. Oh, it's so scary. But it really wasn't. I, was, I mean, I just look ridiculous, frankly. Um, but yeah, I tried to reduce that later on. But I mean, a, a really intense stare, when you're trying to bluff someone, you know, pull off a big one, multiple streets, and they're just staring into your soul. Like, no one has a stare like Phil Ivey. Oh, I remember one time trying to bluff him. And actually, I got it through, but he just... He's, not, he, he, he's usually like kind of uninterested, but then he'll just look. <laughs> and I remember he did it, and I was just like, uh, but he was like, and then he folded. I was like, Phew. I never did it. I, it was the only time I think I tried bluffing him. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, first, on the effects of altruism, um, you can take it to like, the extreme in that, you know, I should live on as little as possible, go to everything to the single most. Yeah. And then, um, the second question was on how have you used the game theory, like lessons learning from poker in kind of your personal life but like outside of poker? Mm. Uh, so yeah, so in, with for effective altruism with the the sort of yeah, living on a small amount, I, I've never been able to do that. And I personally I don't actually think it's it's, I mean, it's all, these things are always so personal. Some people truly, like, that's just, they're very happy living. You know, my friend Will McCaskill, who's one of the, um, arguably one of the founders of it, he tr still lives on 30K a year or whatever, you know, but, but at the same time, like, he doesn't deny himself, like, if he needs a good laptop, he'll get a good laptop and so on. Um, but it's just a philosophy that works for him, and it's not like he, I, th I think the con the problem with people who stick to this stuff too rigidly is that they can then get a feeling of shame and shame is it's just it's just the worst emotion it's like so many problems that we see in the world is because people are like attached to this like idea of like sin and shame and that's just not how these things should be done it's so anti-win-win again talking about aesthetic win-win hates shame um it, it it's not you know there's a way to like if you feel like you've done wrong to sort of a tone or whatever without like getting yourself down because shame is such a sort of like lo uninspiring it sort of makes you sort of close in and, and hate yourself um but anyway i'm getting off track uh so i've personally never subscribed to that in any way i i donate around 10 percent of my income per year but if i've had a bad year it might not be that much and you know there are also it's not all about pure donations especially um you know donations still matter but particularly for this, the people in this room, like your most valuable asset is your, your brain power. 
these problems, like we, there's a huge deficit of smart people who graduate. You know, there's so many people, very smart people who graduate who then sort of get, they get sucked into the game, you know, whether it's investment banking or AI progress as opposed to safety. Um, you know, like right now the ratio is something like a thousand to one in terms of people who go into progress versus just like, hey, can we just check we do this like actually well? Can we just work on alignment instead? Um, so yeah, it, for you guys, I would recommend just thinking about like which sort of air, cause areas really resonate with you and then put your incredible brain power to, to that. That's where the real deficit is. Um, and particularly if you all seem interested in game theory, think about how to solve coordination problems and multipolar traps. Like we need as many people thinking about this stuff immediately. Um, so yeah, that'd be my kind of call to action. So, so cool, everything you're doing. Um, I'm, just, I'm just wondering if um, particularly the kind of making and uncertainty and quantifying uncertainty um, shapes your view at all. I, I don't even know how to phrase the question, um, but you talk a little about your relationship with making decisions under uncertainty while dealing with these long-term essentially existential. Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I, all I know is I probably am dealing with them suboptimally. Um, yeah, because I mean, you can get, particularly if you try to, you know, how do you quantify the value of consciousness? You know, if we're dealing with an existential risk type question, you can end up getting yourself into really crazy conclusions, which is probably what happened again with SBF, right? You know, he, I, I, I think he probably thought he was acting morally the whole time. Who knows? I'm not, I don't want to try and mentally model him, but it, it, it's so difficult when you are dealing with t questions, try, trying to quantify the literal existential value of the world. Um, okay, yeah, go on. So you have a very quantified approach to uncertainty in poker. Yes. Um, is it just the case that these problems like AI safety just can't take that sort of approach because they're too multivariate? Or what could we learn otherwise from that? Mm. I feel like that question is above my pay grade to answer, honestly. Um, like what's coming up is that you can still try and quantify it, but you should have just huge error bars. Um, yeah, I don't know, honestly. But thank you, you know, it's a good question. I wish Igor was here because he'd have a good answer to that. Unfortunately, he's stuck in America, but... Um, yeah, it's a really good question. Your thoughts on the, the latest information on Twitter? Hmm. <laughs> um, I, well, I, the way Twitter was going prior to, you know, the new management taking it over was very concerning to me. Extremely concerning. Just like having, you know, I, 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 I'd been glued to Twitter ever since sort of, <laughs> very end of December, well, January 2020, when like rumblings of COVID were coming, because I, I actually happened to go to China um, for, a, for a job in early January. So I like, had heard about it and I was like, oh, let's pay attention to this. And, uh, and you know, it was so painful seeing how the world was not reacting to this thing that seemed so obvious to me that it was coming. Like, guys, this, this thing is like clearly like there's exponential growth going nuts and no one's doing anything. So my point is, is that I was like very dialed into following the progress of Twitter, uh, of, of the pandemic and everything that came after it through Twitter and watching the level of just sens weird censorship and just like, or just like heavy handedness around the way, you know, it was like something up on high would deem that this was an appropriate narrative versus this and would slap down things and people who I knew to be good faith, even if they turned out to be wrong. You know, like like the ivermectin thing, right? Like, okay, it's probably wrong. But the point is, is that given the informational state at the time, this was this needed to be investigated, and it was not like it was like it was it was like a, it was like saying Voldemort or something. The way, you know, you can't say that, and people would attack people for even mentioning it. And this like weird like propagandic level um, counter narrative that was put put out was was so 
terrifying. And there's been so many instances of this. Um, I was really concerned at the level of like censorship that was, was coming through. Um, that said, I do not envy anyone who is going to try and manage and make Twitter the best place it can be because um, <laughs> I call it, you know, like you're buying the Death Star. It's like this thing. Maybe that's not quite right. It, it could be the, you know, it could be the, the Life Star if it's done right, but right now it's the Death Star. Good luck. You know, it's, it's, it's such an incredible, powerful tool because um, it really is the cutting edge of, of just like civilizational vibe and knowledge. You know, if something's happening in the world, where's the best place to go and look? You don't go and Google New York Times. No, you go on Twitter and see what's being said and search the term. It's really what it is. It's a search engine. That's what Twitter really is. Um, it's a real-time search engine. And so I am very excited about the potential with which it could be, which it could go. But whether or not that potential will be able to be reached is, is another question. Yeah. Um, there's a question like networking. I mean, I know early on you sort of like philanthropy, like futurism part, you had a lot of like sort of pre-built community of like poker players and people that thought like you, but like as that path has like progressed, how do you sort of like sift out the genuinely smart people who are sort of keyed into like that way of thinking and like a sort of culture of like Silicon Valley like presidents mm. that will say they can do that? Mm. Very good question. I mean, asking, just asking people the tough, tough questions around things that you feel like you're familiar with and seeing how they reason through it. Again, it's not like how someone ha whether someone has the right answer that aligns with you, but do they reason through it well and even come up with a way of thinking that you wouldn't have th thought of before? Um, that's A, a good sign of whether someone's a good thinker, but then also are they sort of intellectually honest enough to even like try and like, get into that murky territory. Um, because, you know, there's a lot of people, um, and I think we can all be that, depending on just what our state of mind is, but who will sort of want to, you know, they're trying to v signal their smartness. And, and so maybe aren't being maximally authentic. Um, looking for people who are comfortable saying, I don't know. Huge one, because it's so hard. Um, to be able to admit, ah, you know what, I, I actually don't know on this one. Uh, or, or, yeah, like have, having, sh sh show epistemic humility. Um, and also people who are willing to just express, I mean, this is my personal bias, but if someone talks to me and like, oh, I'm like 70% to make it to dinner tonight, I'm like, oh, you're my friend. Yeah, you know, it, it just like willingness to like try and, you know, not only have uncertainty, but then try and quantify it. Um, is usually a good signal. And I think that's, that exists plenty outside of poker. In weird communities, you wouldn't expect it. Um, yeah, I hope that kind of answers it. I just realized I didn't answer your second question, right? What well, it was about, when, how do I use game theory? Yeah, like, I'm um, well, One of the ones is around, like, intuition. Uh, because... You know, poker, you can, sometimes you'll have a good instinct. You know, it's like, when do, when do I use an, if I have an intuition, when do I listen to it over, you know, what the, the logic, you know, what the math, mathematically optimal answer is. Um, that usually ties in, the more experience you have in a thing, the more likely your intuition is going to be honed. So I try and carry that rule of thumb into other, other stuff as well. And to particularly remember that, um, we have a bias to rely on our intuition when we don't want to crunch the numbers you know it's it can be a convenient way of like well I'm just gonna oh this is such a tough decision I'm gonna go with my gut uh and it's like well you know you're trying to decide whether or not to buy a house it's like have you done this one many times have you is your intuition really had chance to gather lots of data on optimal house prices or are you are you just trying to be you don't you're trying to avoid doing the 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 number crunching um so that's one uh thinking probabilistically is obviously a big, you know, like just expected value thinking in general, so useful. Um, oh, there's so many others, sorry, they're not coming to me right now. But. Okay, we'll take a couple more questions if anyone's got any. Um, at the back there. Um, thinking about what you said around weirdness and epistemic humility, and that this is a weird thing to, you know, it's strange to say, oh, I'm 70% likely to be out of comfort, 
I'll, I'll join you in a minute. Um, how much do you think would be good if, if more folks in the world are taking these sorts of points, uh, even if the average level of weirdness goes down a bit? And how much would you prefer that this sort of thinking is still quite rare, but very high quality, mm. um, if you see the trade off Yeah, 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 like the sort of the dilution of... Yeah, because you'll lose the signal, like what we just talked about, like as a way of identifying someone who thinks, you know, you might lose that signal. But I think on there, it's got to be better. If like, if we can just like raise the sanity waterline a little bit, the average person, the way things, you know, even in government, if they could just a little bit be, you know, a little bit of statistical literacy would be nice. Um, I mean, again, not to knock all, you know, I'm sure there are good politicians, but just like the average style of decision making just is so appalling. Anything that shifts towards that direction would be would be useful because it's it's just so it's so lacking right now. Um, yeah. Okay. Have you thought about politics? Ah, funny enough, my mum and dad literally asked me. They were like, "Oh, you could." You. Um, I just I, I couldn't think of anything more awful like. It just, especially now, it's so vicious. Everything, I mean, I, the, the, I'm living in the US, so maybe things, I, I'm being excessively cynical, but it's just, it's so partisan there. And it's just, everyone is optimizing for pleasing the party as opposed to actually thinking about each, each piece of policy in a rational way. Um, it just, like, it seems like the wrong game. It's like, change, it don't, change the game before you try and win at the game it, 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 it's so broken the game I don't want to just become another cog in that um also I I don't personally think I have the stomach for it like it's just like the level of attack you get all the time and people will try and pick apart your life and so on like I wouldn't wish that upon anyone um and you know having been in been around people who you know are very famous and who are getting attacked frequently and just seeing like the, sh the shit people make up about you is just insane and uh, I just don't know if I would want that target on my back frankly um and also I just don't think it's my I, I don't I don't even know what I don't know enough about it honestly but um thank you for the sort of compliment in the question I guess <laughs> um I think we'll wrap it up here, but we're going to go to the front of the library in a minute um, for a meet and greet, so you'll have a chance to continue the questions. Just the last one quickly from me. Um, I mean, I, I do a human, I do a language, and, but I know you have a background in physics. Um, would you say STEM students have a significant advantage uh, when playing poker over humanity students, or uh, how's that, how's that balance work out? Wow. Talk about finding a zero something. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Find the win-wins in life, not the win-losers. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, given that the game is so GTO heavy these days, and I guess, again, like if I had to bet a bunch of money on a random STEM student versus a random humanities, probably I'd put my money on the STEM. But I don't know. At this point, it's it, it, it like there's so... There... You know, a really smart person in humanities... I don't know. Intelligence is so fuzzy and fluid. It's it's not like one. I I don't think it's a, a it's 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 more like who's willing to sit and study charts in this like I don't want to say the word you know, but in this very uh, way. Uh, and <laughs> it's more likely to be a STEM student that's willing to do that work. You know, it's. Uh, uh, does that mean it's intelligence? No, I don't think so. It's I don't know. I don't, you know, obviously I'm a, a STEM person. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that, Kofal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thank cool. you so much. Um, can we have a round of applause for Liz? Thank you. <laughs>